Let's see. So we have uh, complained about the timing. We start uh, the webinar. We started this webinar late in the afternoon in Italian time to be more uh, compressed to you, Bob, and to the US and North American, South American guys. So let's hope they've joined us. Let's start. We are a few minutes in. And uh, in any case, the beginning is a presentation of us. Uh, you know, for those of you who don't know us, I am Paolo, VP of Sales of uh, GM International, and Bob, Bob Johnson, is here with us, our guest speaker. Uh, he, is, uh, he has a long experience, you know, over 30 years of experience. And in fact, a long experience with us also, we've done many webinars together. And he's an he's a EX World Champion, let's say. So he's a <laughs> Comp EX instructor and an instructor of the ICEX Comp PC scheme. Both schemes is an instructor of. He's also an inspector and a member of the US UL STP committee. And as I said, he's very, very qualified, you know, to run these webinars on standards or EX in general. Together, we also st just started to run some uh, certification courses. Now it's all online. You can find them on our website. Let me take a moment before we begin. I need to spend a few words about GMI, who we are, what we do, and why we do it. So GM International designs, engineers, and manufacturers a complete range of intrinsically safe and certified devices for most automation packages, from DCS to fire and gas, or SCADA, marine, and so on, integrated in all industrial sector, from oil and gas to food and bath. We have over 40 years of experience, and we are very proud to manufacture 100% of our products here in our state-of-the-art facility near Milano. On the other end, we are a global player with... Uh... Oh, you did not change the slide. I was expecting a different slide. I, it's okay. So, uh, well, as, as we said, you know, we use state-of-the-art technology. We have full product traceability. We do 100% testing. We are raw service compliant. We are TUV functional safety management certified up to SIL3, SC3 certification. And basically, you know, we do this product because we care. We care for the environment we're in. We care for the people that work in the factories and industry that we sell our product to. And of course, customer satisfaction is our must. So those, these are the product we manufacture, uh, IS Barrier safety relays with and without line monitoring. We have isolators, also seal certified. We have a line of power supplies, EX and seal certified, and a line of multiplexer, temperature, digital, art multiplexer. Also, we manufacture lots of termination boards and design to interface with the most, most of the system out there. And the line of surge protectors and loop indicators. And as you can see here, we also run functional safety seal and EX training and services. And now we have just added cybersecurity to this. Next slide, Bob. So we are present in 10, with 10 direct offices and over 75 distributors. We are about 200 super dedicated employees here. And we run many courses, webinars, seminars, and we have thousands of installations. Some of our customers are uh, system vendors from ABB to Yokogawa, not forgetting any, many EPC projects we deal with, and OEMs. We are very proud to sell our product to OEMs that make oh, any sort of equipment, drilling equipment, uh, well lead packages, uh, Christmas tree valves, whatever is out there in the oil and gas because our products are very reliable and can withstand up to 70 degrees of temperature. So they're used in many, many OEM packages. And of course, we are the AVL of many end users. And I believe this is the bit on GMI. So now it's a turn to for Bob to give you a run on these standards. Let me take a second to tell you that the only way you can connect with us, you can talk to us is through the question and answer box. We will try to answer the question along or at the end of the webinar. Okay, great, Bob, it's all yours. All right, well, thank you, Paolo, and, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, this is a, a, a good topic. I know some of this will probably be reviewed to some of you. Um, 
and we could really go in depth. And the problem is we only have about 45 to 50 minutes to kind of cover a lot of this material. So we're going to look at these standards somewhat from a high level, but we will talk about some of the specific standards um, where you may be involved in. <clears throat> I know from our pre-registration group that one of the questions that always comes up is which standards do I need to follow? And it really just depends of what role you take within that, um, within the chain, if you will. If you're a installer, you're gonna follow a certain set of standards. If you're a manufacturer, you're gonna really focus your attention on other sets of standards. But we'll kind of highlight uh, where the relevant information is, what are some of the key things that you're gonna find in the standards, some of the differences between the IEC standards and some of the other world standards that you'll see out there. Um, and the commonality, if you will, with some of these standards. So what we really want to do is just kind of give you an overview and a highlight of these standards and what's new, what's coming, what's new, how to understand them. So if I can move my slide, which I'll do. So the 60079 standards, if you're in the EX world, the 60079 standards should be very familiar to you if you're doing anything to international requirements. So where do they come from? <clears throat> uh, the 60079 standards are developed by the International Electrotechnical Commission. And specifically, there is a technical committee, TC31, which is a subgroup of the IEC that is responsible for maintaining, updating, and writing of various EX standards. So who makes up TC31? There's 41 participants, ah, excuse me, participating countries that are involved and 11 countries are observers. So the members basically are individuals that represent each country. So every country of the 41 has a vote, um, if you will, or they're part of that whole process in which the standards come about. And of course, those individuals represent uh, various organizations throughout the world. The United States is a member of TC31. Um, we actually, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I think the actual chairman of TC31 is actually a, a guy here from the US. And uh, the committee members are nominated by the country specific organizations. So this is where these standards come from. And you can actually go onto the IEC uh, dashboard, if you will, and you wanna find out who those individuals are. If you ever wanna reach out to them, you can certainly find out who those people are. Uh, it's very transparent. So the relevant standards for EX, and, and these are not necessarily all of them, but these are the main ones. These are the ones that you're gonna run into. And what I tried to do with this slide was to try to give you an indication of if you're a manufacturer or if you're a designer or you're an installer or responsible for maintenance, what are the standards that you're really gonna want to focus your attention on? So, uh, the first one is your general requirements, the dash zero. So everybody should have a copy of dash zero. This is, gives you all of the generalities uh, of all the details of what's in the other standards, definitions, all of the relevant information. There's also information in there on how to properly mark equipment, definitions, all of that good stuff. So dash zero is a very all encompassing standard. Now you'll also see right below that, you'll see flame proof dash one and then pressurized and then five, six, seven, so forth and so on. These are the standards that apply to specific products. So if I'm building say a flame proof enclosure, I'm gonna be paying a lot of attention to dash zero. And I'm also gonna be pay paying particular attention to dash one because dash one is gonna tell me what do I need to do to make sure that my box that I'm designing will meet these requirements? So there'll be things in there that will give you in information as far as pressures, uh, dimensions, tolerances, types of um, flame, um, either threaded design, flanges, uh, all that type of information is gonna be located in dash one. As we progress through these standards, number two would be for pressurized enclosures powder filling, liquid immersion, increased safety. If I'm again building a junction box or I'm building a cabinet that's involved in using increased safety as a protection concept, 
we need to pay particular close attention to dash seven. Intrinsic safety, if you notice there, there's SC31G, that's actually a subcommittee of TC31. So intrinsic safety is, is kind of broken off, if you will, and it's still part of TC31, but there's a subcommittee that's really responsible for writing uh, the details on that particular standard. And you'll see that also with some of the other standards where I reference SC31J. Um, that's a, again, another subcommittee of TC31. So the other things to pay attention to, if I'm a designer, notice that I've highlighted the dash zero, but now I've also said area classification. That's 10-1 and 10-2. So this is where we, we determine, if you will, uh, our area classifications in our process facility. Is it a zone zero? Is it a zone one? Is it zone two? Uh, what's the likelihood of uh, sources of releases? You know, what's our diameters? What's our velocities? What's our ventilation? All of that information is, is based upon 10-1. Now, if I'm a manufacturer, <clears throat> excuse me, or if I'm a, if I'm a designer of, of systems, I'm not necessarily going to be uh, someone that needs to know necessarily all those details because that's going to be typically done by the end user. So usually the end user is going to do their area classification studies. They will come back and then they will tell the various subcontractors to say, look, our area is this. You need to make sure that you're designing for this particular environment. And then that goes down to, uh, again, to the level of the manufacturers. The one standard that I, I think is really important that a lot of people have questions about is the Dash 14 standard. This one is the design, install, and selection of EX equipment. The competency programs that you hear about, such as the IEC EX, COPC, or COMPEX, are very much based upon the Dash 14 standard. So I know here in the United States, a lot of US designers, installers, contractors, uh, we use the National Electric Code and we follow articles 505 or 500 through 516 for designing systems for hazardous locations. Well, the Dash 14 is, is really a very similar type document. This gives you kind of the nitty gritty details as far as what types of cable glands you should be using, um, how, we're, how we're applying EX equipment, how we're protecting EX equipment, how we can interface with various different types of protection concepts. All of that information is going to be located in Dash 14. When we get into 15, again, that's a protection concept from a manufacturer. Ventilation analyzers, again, that's more for a system, uh, maybe an analyzer system that's very similar to pressurized uh, the Dash 2 standard, but it gets into more details specifically to say analyzer shelters or buildings. Inspection and maintenance, the Dash 17 standard is very much involved uh, as well from a maintenance perspective and doing that initial detailed inspection and periodic inspections of EX equipment. So it's really important that the end user is following that but it's also important for the manufacturer to understand that as well, because what we see sometimes, especially if a manufacturer is building equipment, they almost always are gonna to have to go through some sort of factory acceptance test of an FAT of some sort. And that's the point in which you would want to do a detailed inspection as detailed from the Dash 17 standard. So just because we're not necessarily worried about maintaining the equipment once it gets out in the field, uh, we still have an inspection requirement even for that integrator or in some cases the manufacturer. So it's, it's important to understand. Encapsulation, again, another protection technique. Repair and overhaul, this is a fairly new standard and this has to deal with uh, specific EX equipment that we wanna bring out of service and we want to repair and overhaul and bring it into a safe state. So this would, uh, this would really apply to say motors or very large pieces of EX equipment that we don't want to just uh, throw them away, <laughs> but they need to be repaired, they need to be fixed, brought back into good service, and that's what the standard that we're going to follow for that. You'll see some other ones here, and I'm not going to go through every single one of these, but 
A couple of them that are, are somewhat important and pay attention on. <clears throat> the One of the latest ones is what is called the IEC TS 60079-46. This deals now with equipment assemblies. So if I'm a skid package manufacturer where I'm taking a bunch of different EX equipment and I'm putting them all together, there's actually a certification scheme for the entire assembly. Um, and this has a lot to do with the requirements of what is spelled out in the Dash 14 standard, the design standard. So it's the selection of the appropriate glands, cabling, installation requirements as part of an overall assembly. Now there's also some other uh, standards that you may or may not be familiar with, the 80079 set of standards. There's 20-1, 20-2. These give you the details as to the characteristics of gases and dust. So if we want to find out exactly what the ignition temperature are or is of various gases, what gas groups they would fall into, these documents will actually give you a lot of that information. If I'm manufacturing equipment, EX equipment, the Dash 34 standard has uh, been updated and it is uh, now putting a lot more onerous uh, requirements upon manufacturers to make sure that their quality process on manufacturing EX equipment uh, is very much uh, up to date. And it's very much a similar document to your ISO 9001 certification. The other ones that we'll talk a little bit more about here later on is the 36 and 37, which are non-electrical equipment and the protection concepts that deal with non-electrical equipment. So these are some fairly new standards that have been adopted by the IEC, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Some of the other things on the horizon is the 44 and 45, which are have to deal with personal competency as well as internal combustion engines. So hopefully these two slides will tell you as a manufacturer, a designer, or an installer, what are the relevant standards, where you should be looking uh, to try to get some uh, good information. Now there's always a question with regards to uh, EN standards or IEC standards. So the important thing to know the difference is, is that the EN standards, if you notice the numbers on the right-hand side of the two different standards, there's an IEC version and there's, in this case, a BSEN standard. The, the IEC standard is the base standard and it's developed by Technical Committee TC31. Now, there are members of TC31 that also sit on the committees of Senelec, who is responsible for writing Euro norm standards or EN standards. And what happens is that once it gets published by the IEC, then Senelec has agreed to take that standard and republish it, if you will, as an EN standard. And then it gets adopted by each country within, say, for example, the European Union. So then it becomes a BS in the case of a UK standard, a BS EN 60079 standard. When we actually look at the details of the standards themselves, when we look inside, we'll actually see that the actual technical requirements between the IEC and the EN standard are identical. It's actually the same standard, if you will. There are some, however, differences. So again, the, the your norm standards are published and developed by Senelec. And then again, as I mentioned here recently, or just now, the BSEN version, the IEC standards within the EN standards are referenced as EN standards, and that's in Annex ZA. And again, the main text of the technical standard is identical to the IEC. So what this boils down to is that, does that mean that if I have a product that is built to an IEC standard, I can automatically just take that and use it in Europe? Doesn't necessarily mean that. But what it does mean from a technical standpoint, if I've built a flame-proof box to the Dash 0 and the Dash 1 standards, I'm not gonna have to go above and beyond from a technical standpoint to comply with the Euronorm standards. I'm gonna to have to do possibly some additional quality stuff. I'm gonna to have to do some additional markings. Uh, there'll be a different, a different cert that will be issued for it, but the actual technical details of what constitutes a flame proof box will be identical. 
So our well, first well, question. There is a lot of standards and see if our guests have been listening. <laughs> Guys, we have a question for you. There's a poll. I'm going to launch this poll. Uh, you can try to answer what 60079 standard will apply to every EX certified electrical product. So you have the 7901711. Yep. So I'm not sure, Bob, I've been listening. <laughs> yeah. So, Paolo, what do you think? What I think. God, I would imagine zero, you know, is a base for everything, but this is my wild guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, honestly, yeah. we'll give it, give it another give it away for you guys. So, anyhow, um, we're not going to judge you. Uh, you can vote, you can vote uh, anonymously. We won't know who's vote what, and basically, we don't care. We just want to get some interaction from you, making sure you're still alive, still awake. <laughs> Paying attention. Okay, uh, I guess most of you have voted, so let me end the poll and let me show you the result. Show the result. So we have a variety of answers from, you know. Right. You know, yeah, so, so the correct answer here would be dash zero. So that is the general standard. So that's going to apply to every protection concept, um, the details in dash zero. So when we look at certs, as we'll look at here in just a little bit, you'll actually see that standard dash zero will show up on the certs uh, in addition to the various protection concepts because we have to comply with dash zero as well as whatever the protection concepts. And we could have multiple protection concepts built into a product. So for example, if we look at a GMI barrier, right? We look at a cert for a GMI uh, safety relay or an IS barrier, you will see one of the standards that'll be referenced is dash zero. It'll also reference dash 11 for intrinsic safety, but it'll also reference probably dash 15, which is for non-sparking or non-sparking or non-arcing. Yeah. Non -arcing. And then also probably the dust standards. So yeah. you're gonna see a bunch of different standards that'll be referenced on a particular certificate. But yes, again, dash zero is gonna show up pretty much everywhere. Okay. okay. So continuing on, since I mentioned a little bit about the EN standard in comparison to the IEC standards, there are some differences with regards to the marking of EX equipment that's a requirement under the ATEX directive and what's a requirement under the IEC. So if you look at the top line, what you see there, you'll see, a, a, a first off, you'll see a certificate number. Then you'll see a 01, that was the date in which the certificate was first issued, ATEX 027X. The CE marking, the 0722 number is actually the number for the notified body. So that's SESI's notified body number. So anything that SESI does will always have a 0722. Then you'll see that familiar hexagon EX. Uh, then you'll see a Roman numeral two, that's a surface industry. Uh, Category two, gas and dust, and category is the uh, ATEX directives uh, way of signifying for the potential where it can be placed, if you will, for the hazard. And then the marking string, the EXDB, 2B plus H2, T5, GB, so forth and so on. If we look at the string right below it, we see we also have in this particular instance uh, an IEC EX certificate also issued by SESI. In this case, it was issued in the year 2016. Um, and then we don't see things like a CE. We don't see the 0722, the EX, the Roman numeral 2, 2 GD, so forth and so on, but we find the other information. So it's, a, it's left up to the manufacturer on exactly how they wish to market if they have both ATEX and IEC EX, but there are details in the dash zero standard that will give you that information of exactly how manufacturers should be marking products. But this is an example of a product that is certified both to the ATEX directive as well as IECEX certified. Now, when I said that there was no technical differences between the IEC standard and the EN standard, um, that is true for the most part, however, there was one big difference, and it's important for people to understand this. 
the installation and design standard uh, dash 14, they made a big change in the dash uh, in, in dash 14 in 2013 on the selection of cable glands for use for direct entry into flame proof boxes. So what happened is that the UK disagreed with what the IEC had actually published, but they couldn't change the standard because it was adopted by Senelec. So what the UK did in particular, they put in a national annex to their version of BSEN 60079-14. And basically this national annex is going against what is referenced in the EN standard. And it's saying, look, if you're gonna do something in the UK, you need to do something a little bit different. So this is just an example for any of you who are interested in the differences between the old standard and the new standard. If any of you are involved in the selection and installation of cable glands for EXD applications, if we look on our left-hand side, that was the requirement based upon the 2007 standard. We were using, in this case, non-barrier glands um, in most instances, right? If we look at the, the slide on the right hand side, we see that based upon the fact that now we're more concerned about the cable length, um, and that's the big deciding factor, we might have to use barrier glands as opposed to non-barrier glands based upon the new standard. Um, the, the reason I bring this up is that this comes up quite a bit. As a matter of fact, I was talking with a customer yesterday about this whole topic. And one of the things that I mentioned to him, I said, look, you have, to, you have to realize what is your client calling out as the relevant standard? Are they following the IEC 60079-14 from 2013? Or are they following the BSEN 60079-14 from the year 2014, which goes back to the old requirements like what you see on the left-hand side? So it's important to understand this and know the difference between the two because it can definitely create some issues. Now, what we saw on the previous slide, we saw on the right-hand side where we might have to use barrier glands where previously we didn't. However, that's not always the case. Based upon the latest standard or the older standard, we might have to use barrier glands in those instances where today we wouldn't. So it's not, it's not just where we used them before, we don't have to, and where we didn't have to before, we do. You have to look at the standards to get that detailed information. Well, here we go, we have another poll, and while we do launch this poll, guys, uh, maybe a little tough, we haven't talked about too much about length of cable, but what is the length of cable distance that is referencing the 2013? where barrier gland must be used terminating into EXT enclosure. Now, why our guest answer this question? We have a like question that says, would you please clarify barrier gland versus non barrier gland for benefit of? Yes. Uh, so a barrier gland versus a non barrier gland. So this is an example, these two pictures here. Uh, this is considered to be a non barrier type. So what you have, you have an inner seal but this is an elastomeric seal. Uh, this is a, a brand called Hawk that makes what is called a diaphragm seal. And that seal right there is actually a flame-proof seal, but it's an elastomeric seal. That's not to be confused with the back seal, which is providing ingress protection and pull-out strength. The difference is down here at the bottom, you see there's actually a compound material. This is a hardened compound that becomes very, very hard and it's a permanent installation. So once that gets packed or poured, that is a permanent installation. Uh, you, can, you can certainly disassemble the gland, but if you had to re-pull or do something different with your cable, you'd have to cut it off and, and start anew. So that's considered to be a barrier gland down here, B, <laughs> and this is an NB, and I apologize for my writing <laughs> with my mouse. But that's a barrier and a non-barrier. Okay, great. Well, as you mentioned, I'll share the result here. Uh, you know, the standards do change. They keep getting updated. And we know that because we have to recertify, re, re, you know, revalidate our product. 
every so often. You know, we're just in the midst of uh, revalidating a sort of complete line of product for because of the zone two standards, you know, change from NA to NC. Or, right. Um, and you have a certain number of time, maybe a year or two after which the standard becomes obsolete and you need to requalify. And in fact, uh, you should be careful, guys. You know, there are products out there that uh, reference to old standards. They were certified, they're no longer valid. So, you know, you have yeah. to look into this. You cannot just take a certificate and say, yeah, I got it, it's okay. <laughs> right. And we talk about that here in just a second. Uh, so, the okay, correct. So, what's the right answer? We got all sorts of answers less than five meters, more than five meters, less than three meters. So where we should use barrier glands is when we have cable lengths of less than three meters, equal to or less, less than three meters. So well, that was uh, came on top with less than five meters. So you guys were yeah. okay. <laughs> okay, let's move forward. Okay, I'm going to close that. For we're you. doing time. Time we're doing great. Yeah, we're doing fine. So here's here's kind of along your question or what you were bringing up, Paulo. So once standards get published, how long do they remain valid, right? Yeah, exactly. So there is an IECEX uh, document. There's a bunch of IECEX documents, and, and this is true under Europa as well, pretty much. They're, they're similar. They're not exact. But mm -hmm. a newer initial COC shall be only be issued to the current standard or one edition prior. So in the, in the reasoning for that, if you think about it, when we go back to that list of all those standards, these standards don't get all updated at once, meaning that one standard might get updated in 2015, another standard gets updated in 2017, another one gets updated in 2018, so forth and so on. And if we're having to follow multiple standards, and maybe we have to follow five different standards, that would mean that, oh my God, we have to retest or we have to reevaluate our product every single time when a standard gets updated. And, and we do, but it's not quite as onerous as long as we follow the current standard or one edition prior. Yeah, um, in fact, it does lead to confusion though, Bob, because you have yeah. customers say, this is the latest standard and your compliance here is to the one prior. And uh, you can say, well, it is still valid, but uh, it, it leads to confusion. So uh, more often than not, you have to follow the latest because the right. the customer is always right. Now, what you will find too along those lines, uh, um, so a, a manufacturer such as GMI, when you actually go to the IECEX website and you look at certs, you might find uh, edition zero all the way through edition 10 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, that means that basically this manufacturer, GMI, has, has done the initial cert around these standards back a couple years ago. And as the standards get updated, then they issue an edition one or issue two, edition, issue three, so forth and so on. It doesn't necessarily mean that the manufacturer actually has got to go through additional testing, but it just means that the certification body in conjunction with the manufacturer has evaluated the requirements of the new standard versus the older standard, did a gap analysis between the two and said, well, look, that doesn't affect my product Therefore, or this change in the standard doesn't affect my product. Therefore, I'm already in compliance. compliant to the new standard. For We're in compliance reason. with the new standard. So it's just a matter of updating the certificate that's say. Let me give you guys a hint, you know, some, because a manufacturer tends to like not changing the certificate number because that's printed on every single product. So that's, when the standard is updated, it's a new page in the same certificate. So you have certificates that are 30, 40 pages long and you look at the first page and it looks very old. You need to scroll down. You know, we get this question yeah. all the time. It says, well, well, just go to page 39 <laughs> or 40 and you'll find the latest standards. Yeah, and we're gonna look at a certificate, I think later on that, that will kind of show that. So the European Commission standards have date in which they come into effect as well at what point they have become non-conforming. So, if we look at that first line, uh, the reference standard with a dash zero from 2012 with the addendum in 2013, it was published. Uh, date of withdrawal is at 7-6-2021, right? So that means at that particular point in time, that particular standard will no longer be valid. So 
the information is out there for the manufacturers, the users to follow. You just have to do some digging to find that information. So here's again, the certificate showing standards, right? So here's a GMI product. And if we notice there that we see on the right-hand side, we're actually, let me see if I can annotate this. We see this little box here, right? There was an initial issue on 2012, and then there was an issue one that was issued in 2016. Uh, it could have been because of the fact that obviously the standards have changed. Uh, it may have involved some testing. You can usually find that information within the CERT, but here's the important information that I mentioned. These are the standards in which the product has actually been tested to and which version of those standards, right? Seven, six, five, five point one, so forth and so on. So it's important to at least understand what you're looking at when we're looking at these certs for products to, to understand, hey, what's the date of these? Is it still relevant? Is it still valid? And all that good stuff. Now, when we look at type examination certificates, right? And this is kind of where, where Paulo was talking about. A lot of times the type of examination certificates will actually have a lot of that information that was previous. And this might be the information that's at the very back of the original certificate. So as Paulo said, you might get a certificate from a manufacturer that will reference the old ATEX directive or older standards. It's important to go back to the last pages, if you will, under your ATEX certificates. And that's where you'll find the latest greatest. So under IEC EX certificates, they do issues. The old one gets basically, it doesn't mean the old one's no good. It just means that the old one is old. The latest is the greatest. The ATEX directive or certificates built uh, or the certificates issued by the notified body to the directive will basically reference um, the most recent or they'll, they'll be in chronological, they'll, they'll, they'll keep going sequentially, so to speak if that makes sense. Hopefully it does. So how the standard format works, usually it's a five to eight cycle, year cycle for the standards. Uh, you basically find scope, terms, and definitions, the main portions, sometimes IP ratings, and then annexes. So annexes within the standard are in the back. Uh, people forget about looking at these, but these are very helpful. So the normative annexes provide additional information. The informative, these are also very helpful because this more takes what you find in the standard and tries to give you examples. Um, and it may have information outside of the norm that might assist on the application of the standard itself. So it's important to look at the annexes when we're looking at these standards because sometimes we, we have questions on it. And uh, usually some of those questions can be answered by looking in the informative section of the standard. Now, when we look at EN standards, as I mentioned before, they're basically the same with the exception of, of Annex ZA. And that'll reference the relevant IEC to EN standard. And they may have and will have additional annexes on compliance to the European market, including the ATEX directive. So you'll see things like category and the marking requirements under the ATEX directive will be located in Annex ZA. And it'll say the equivalent IEN standard to the IEC standard will be 60079-0, shall be 60079-0, except with an EN. So that's what the format will look like on your EN standards. Now, the mechanical standards, we'll get into this and talk a little bit about this. This is causing a lot of uh, headache, heartache for a lot of people right now, because these are fairly new. Um, they were jointly developed in conjunction with the ISO and CINELEC as well, and they were introduced in 2016. The information that came out of the 80079 standards were based upon the Senelec standards, in this case, the 13463 standards. So what we're talking about here, this does not apply to electrical equipment, but it applies now to mechanical equipment that could be a potential source of ignition while in use in hazardous areas. So now we're talking about things like couplings, pumps, gearboxes, brakes, uh, bearings, those types of things that if under a fault condition or even under normal condition 
will they heat up to a point or cause some sort of issue and potentially uh, have some sort of ignition source that could cause an explosion. And when we, we've talked about this in some of the other webinars, when we look at some of the root causes of some of the big failures with industrial accidents, we actually find that in many cases, it's not necessarily an electrical issue that was the source of ignition. It could have been mechanical equipment. And, and there's quite a few examples out there in industry where there's been bearing failures or something heats up or something uh, non-electrical that's actually been the, the ignition source. So what are the ignition sources? Well, these are the same types of ignition sources that we see with electrical equipment, right? Except instead of electrically generated sparks could be mechanically generated sparks. But the same types of things are referenced in the 80079 standards as to potentially um, uh, as, as sources of ignition. So looking at a certificate so this is a certificate of conformity, an IEC EX certificate of conformity. Notice that this particular product, this is a valve. This is not traditionally an electrical product, right? But it's a valve. And in this case, it's marked EXH. And we have a similar marking string that what we would find to our electrical equipment. And notice that the standards that we're applying in this particular instance are the ISO 80079-36 and 37. So we're now starting to see in many cases, many customers, many clients are starting to make this a requirement for the electrical equipment that they shall be certified in some way, shape or form. So this is now causing an issue for a lot of the mechanical engineers that they're having to go back and look at a lot of their equipment um, and reevaluate some of this stuff to make sure that these are not potentially sources of ignition. So some of the changes just generally to the standards, really the electrical standards, what you will now see historically, and this is uh, maybe I'll, I'll just highlight some of this stuff a little bit. Traditionally, you would see something like this, EXD. Well, now what you're finding is what is called EXDB. So we have now added what is called the EPL to the marking strings. So the same thing holds true for EXE. Now it's gonna be EXEB. When we had EXPX, it's now PXB. PY is PYB, so forth and so on. Notice some of these N standards that you see down here, right? Some of these that were referenced within the dash 15 standard have now been pulled out. And these are now being put into other standards. So for example, EXNA, which was a lesser form of increased safety, non-arcing, instead of having a standard that was the DASH 15 standard, this information has now been put into the DASH 7 standard, which is increased safety. EXNC, enclosed break, is a lesser form of flame proof. So now that's been put into the DASH 1 standard. Energy limitation, NL, that's now gone into the intrinsic safety standard. So that doesn't mean that products that are marked with these markings are no good, doesn't mean that they're not valid. But what you will see now is manufacturers will be replacing those marks, these marks with these marks. And the same thing holds true for these marks are now gonna be replaced by these marks over here. So there are some changes with regards to marking. If you don't, you, you may see that, or you probably have seen that. If you're a manufacturer, you're sure, certainly well aware of that. Some of the other things, uh, addition to the mechanical standards, as we just talked about, the assembly certification. And you're also seeing a lot more now as far as references to some of the functional safety standards. So the 61508 and the 61511 standards for functional safety are now starting to show up um, <clears throat> with regards to some of the uh, EX equipment because it, it very much, they, they coexist, if you will. And of course, the introduction of the personal competency uh, technical standard or technical specification that's gonna be introduced. So it's going to be much more of a requirement that the individuals that are dealing in the EX world become competent, learn, study, show your competency in some way, shape or form. 
Some of the other standards that we don't really get into a lot here, but are certainly important to note, if we're dealing specifically for the mobile and uh, or the offshore market, we want to also reference the 61892 series. Uh, the dash seven basically takes a lot of information that we've learned in the 60079-14 and applies it a little bit more towards the marine business. Uh, 60034 deals with rotating electric machines. The 92 series deals with electrical installation with ships. 502, tankers, special features. This could be tankers that are carrying LNG or being powered by LNG. Uh, this is a big issue right now because with all the clean fuels and everybody's making all these conversions, well, guess what? Part of those requirements reference back to the 60079 standards. So you have to be aware of that. Uh, and then 60364 is our low voltage electrical installations. Always be aware too, is that obviously there's, there's wiring regulations within the UK, US, Canada, all over the world. So we also have to make sure that we're following all of that. The important thing to note with regards to the EX600 or the IEC60079 standards is almost every other international EX standard is based upon the 60079 standard but it may require additional testing and or certification. So if we're doing projects in Russia, we need to have the CRTU certificate or TRCU certification. Uh, it's based upon the 60079 standards. If we need to do things to uh, Brazil, we still are following 60079, but we have some additional uh, marking requirements and all that good stuff. Yeah, so, as a matter of fact, Bob, we have a question on that and might be, well, you have a poll, let's run this poll and then I'll ask you the question. So this is a lot easier than the other one, seems, looks like. What is the <laughs> most likely source of ignition with regard to mechanical equipment used in ASLOC? Most likely. So there's not actually a wrong answer here. I believe all can be a source of ignition, <laughs> but which is the most likely? Spark, surfaces, static, mechanicals, or isothermic reactions? Uh, you, I see a lot of answers coming in. You guys seem to you know, be familiar with that. So let me ask you, we have an interesting question that basically mentioned locally, you have to follow local standards. I mean, there are international standards, but, uh, you know, for example, in Europe, we have ATEX directive and, uh, okay, they are similar to ICX, but we have to follow the ATEX directive. And there are some differences. The question was, are differences uh, significant or just maybe marking? I guess it depends on, on, on the standard on the country. I, I can give you an example, Bob. In Japan, okay, JIS standard is based on ICEX, but they interpret it in a very different ways. Right. And to adapt to that, we had to change some of our design yeah. to comply to their standard, which was compliant with all. It was more restrictive, basically. Yeah. More restrictive view on the same standard. But yeah, I, I would say this. I mean, the IEC standards are published, right? And it's up to, they, they carry no legal weight, if you will, unless it's adopted verbatim by some governmental entity. So really what the important thing is to note is look at specifically what, what carries the most weight is that country's wiring regulations, right? So in the United States, we follow the National Electric Code, but ultimately it falls down to the authority who has jurisdiction, we call that the AHJ. And depending on where you are in the world, uh, in the United States, we have multiple AHJs. We have the US Coast Guard is one, we have BESI, we have OSHA. In the UK, you have the HSC, you have multiple uh, authorities who have jurisdiction. So just because you have IEC, EX, or just because you have ATEX doesn't necessarily just mean, yes, I can use it completely. That will be a basis, but generally, if you, if you follow their wiring regulations, they'll spell it out and tell you specifically what you can and cannot do. So it, it is important to understand the standards are there for everybody to use, but it's really up to each country on how they apply it. Correct. So here yeah, we have multiple answers. I don't really know which is the right answer this time. Yeah. So generally what we find uh, is uh, correctly, and most of you guys got this, was the mechanically generated sparks. So uh, 
uh, rotating equipment is usually the has been the biggest culprit, if you will. It could be bearings, it could be uh, something a motor shaft or something like that. Something that's rotating, that's either heating up or generating some sort of electric or, or mechanical sparks. And it's it's really not electrical sparks. It'd be mechanically generated sparks. Uh, hot surfaces certainly is is a big one. Static certainly a buildup. And again, when we have movement of mechanical equipment and it involves uh, say non-metallic tanks or things like that, then we could have a buildup of static electricity. So we have to be aware of that as well. And a lot of these things are more, I would say this much, it's things that a lot of us in industry have thought about for many years and we do and we address it, but it's not in many cases been really spelled out specifically up until fairly recently. Um, certainly some countries have had uh, recommendations on how to deal with mechanically equipment or mechanical equipment for years, but it's really now been adopted by the ISO and the IEC to do that. Yeah, and you know, for example, we use a certain kind of plastic in our product that is being specifically designed not to build static electricity because you know you have the product installed in us at this location, then you know we spend all that. So we do have another interesting question. Maybe you want to answer that before we move forward. You know, it's about the standard that we mentioned earlier, the change between EXNA to the new standard. Uh, the 2010 edition of the standard be considered withdrawn have to be changed to EXEC? I mean, is there a deadline for that? There is. I don't know it offline or offhand. Uh, and thank you, Rob, for joining us. I, Isn't it okay. by the end of this year, 2021, no? I don't know. I guess, and I don't want to guess. I'm <laughs> guessing also, but I know that we are working on that. We're working on the change of uh, our you, you self yeah. to that. And I remember listening to something that we have up to the end of the year, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. We will check into that and give an answer, Rob. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's going to be in the official journal uh, as published by Europa. So it'll be in there somewhere. As a matter of fact, just out of curiosity, I don't think, because we had uh, a slide that showed some of the standards, but I don't believe, yeah, this is, this is where we need to follow. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we have 15 on here. No, we don't. So what we want to do is that we're going to look for the information that's going to be... Uh, over in this column here to tell us, hey, when it's getting withdrawn. So that should be, that it should be listed. We just need to find it for you. Okay, so. Okay, well, let's move forward. I think there's a few more slides. We have a, you know, another 10 minutes. Yep. And then you know, we can take some more questions. Actually, we are at the, at the end. So guys, summaries, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, no, so yeah, realize Again, the point I was trying to make with this presentation is that understand that uh, a lot of the information that you're looking into, you know, as a manufacturer, you may not ever pick up the Dash 14 standard or the inspection standard, but be aware of it. And, and it's, I think it's important for people to understand that. And if you're a user and all you care about is making sure that your product is certified to a particular standard, that's fine and dandy. But it's, I think it's also important for everybody to understand, well, maybe it's worthwhile to actually look at some of the product-specific standards. So when a manufacturer comes back and tells you, hey, it's going to cost me X amount of dollars, or I'm going to have to redesign my product, you can actually look at the old standard and the new standard, and you can say, oh, holy cow, yeah, it is. Uh, this is a much more involved process, or maybe it's not a very much involved process. Maybe they're just trying to gig you for more money. But, but realize that you know, there's different roles and responsibilities that we're all in the EX world together. And again, it, it is the weakest link, right? So it's important for everybody in the entire chain to understand uh, how important that the proper design, selection, manufacture, use, maintenance, repair of EX equipment is so important to make sure that we all stay safe. We do have, I think, a couple slides on some we do a. we do uh bob in fact you know we got a couple of questions i will share that okay uh, i'll stop sharing mine for a second yes and i will see if i get the right place should be this one okay you guys see it so our first question that we got for registration was 
what would be some typical examples of mechanical EX equipment? And uh, this is the answer you prepared, Bob. I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, we talked a little bit about uh, what, what could be examples. So ignition resulting from failure in a machine, such as a bearing overheating, um, uh, a hot surface or something like that. That label that you see in the middle of that, you're actually seeing an example of uh, both an ATEX as well as an IEC EX certified product with that EXH marking. And that happens to be a fan. Um, so again, a mechanical piece of equipment that normally we wouldn't think uh, would have to comply with relevant standards. Well, guess what? Now this manufacturer has gone out and spent the time and money had it assessed by a third party and uh, actually has a third party certified uh, fan now that's EXH, if you will. Great. So next, if I can switch. Yeah. Are there equivalent Russian norm to the IEC standards? I believe so, but I'll let you yeah. talk about that. <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely. So yeah, the most recent GOSS standards uh, they're the 31510 series. So if you do a search GOSS 31510, uh, you'll find them out there. I mean, you have to pay for them and all that good stuff, but they are based upon the relevant 60079 standards. Uh, the important thing to note, however, is that, and in, in you might be able to see a little bit of that label down there in the bottom picture, uh, that the markings are also, not just your normal markings that you would find. You'd have some additional markings. Uh, and you'll, you'll find, actually, it also has to be in Russian as well. So, But the actual performance of the product itself, if you build it to an IEC or EN standard, getting Russian approvals is typically more of a, uh, uh, a transactional cost and maybe some label changing. Uh, but basically, that's that's the main issue. The performance. Yeah, and, you know, going back to the answer, you know, the question we had earlier, Russian standard to our experience is very much paperwork. You know, to go from an ICX cert to a Russian cert, it's a lot of paperwork because you have to translate everything in Russian. They need a special manual in Russian, and they need a special documents called passport. But in the end, it's just paperwork. Uh, on the other end to sell to Russia product that have uh, some kind of measuring, for example, analog barrier, you need a metrological certificate, which is not required anywhere else. Uh -huh. So certification says your product is per the spec you design. So you say 0.1% accuracy, well, you have to demonstrate to them and they actually physically test. So it's an additional piece of paper, which that is a lot of work, <laughs> more than just converting. <laughs> So right. every country has uh, their own uh, ways of interpreting some as, you know, as simple as now, for, for example, the UK, you know, UK is yeah. no longer part of the European Union. So in famous Brexit. So we now have to recertify all products according to, it's called UK's, UK, UKAS. UKAS, yes. And uh, we have contacted three different laboratories, uh, you know, and, uh, checking the pricing and it's, it's first of all it's a lot of money but uh and they, they have different views on uh, the type of uh, work we have to do and so it's always down to interpretation <laughs> okay let's see i believe there is, let, there is another question here yes what about other world standards similar to ic yeah IEC? Yeah, I mean, and we talked a little bit about this, but the uh, the U.S. we've adopted the six zero zero seventy nine and and are adopting the eight zero zero seventy nine standards. Now these will show up within our wiring regulations within, uh, and they already do. Actually, the six zero zero seventy nine shows up in NEC five hundred five. Uh, Canada has adopted them as well. Brazil has what is called the NBR IEC standards. Australia has ASNZS. Uh, and other countries as well. So there, there are variations on the theme. They're, for the most part, they're the same. <laughs> yeah, but it, it is a growing movement. I mean, now, for example, uh, to sell to Middle East in uh, the UAE, you need to be certified in the UAE. Now they have their version of this ICX standard. Yes. And yes. so on and so forth. It's moving all over the world. They're taking the standard, Which, making a local yeah. law which means 
more paperwork for money, but uh, yeah, so and it, and it's kind of ironic because the whole idea of the IECEX was to have one standard, one world, one test lab, one market. Yeah, yeah. You know, and now it's basically it's been adopted, but yet people still have barriers to trade, right? And that's you know, really Rob important. is asking why we don't know why, right? <laughs> We don't set the well. I know why. It's because governments want money. <laughs> yeah, well, well, you know, we have a movement. I don't know if you see that in in the U.S. You know, here in Europe, there's a movement, uh, a political movement of people. You know, trying to separate. You know, a lot of strong political movement to say we are Italian. We want to be Italian. Forget Europe. Get out of the euro. And the French are doing the same. And everybody is doing the same. It looks like the world is trying to separate instead of integrate. Yeah. 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 And, and Rob asked a question, why, why haven't we really gone towards IECEX worldwide? And I think it, it still boils down to is that the, the country regulators are still trying to protect their industry in some way, shape or form. Um, so they're putting up barriers to trade. But what they're doing in effect is they're not changing the technical aspects of the product for the most part. They're just saying, well, look, it has to be done by one of our labs, or you have to pay our people, you have to do this, and then we issue this certificate. So it's, it is unfortunate because it would be great if we really truly were at a situation where we could have one product that you could sell anywhere in the world with one marking, but we're not there yet. Yeah, no, we're not there at all. So last question here we had, why ICC conformity are now required to manufacture product to ISO standard? Yeah. Is that and, something I'm not aware of? Yeah, so it's, it's basically, it's referenced in this IECEX document, this operational document. So more or less what's involved is that there should be in effect a um, ignition hazard assessment that is carried out by the manufacturer. And that's what, that's what the 80079 standards entail. So the manufacturer does an ignition hazard assessment or leaves it up to the test lab to do that and do that on the behalf of the manufacturer. Or it can be done by the manufacturer themselves and reviewed by the test lab. And then a certificate is actually issued for it. Uh, one thing that is important as of 2019, those old EN 13463 standards they no longer provide presumption of conformity to the ATEX directives. So you would have to follow the EN version of 80079-36 and 37. Well, okay, great guys. So we come to the end of our webinar a few minutes later, but anyhow, all our, you can look online our live webinar schedule, you know, that keeps getting updated. We keep adding new webinars. And if you missed uh, any, you can go to our YouTube channel and look at the recording. Of all the, including this one. We will share the slides uh, to all of you guys. Let me see if I can run the, the poll while I share my slides. Let me try that, launch poll. So you can, you can give a vote to Bob. Please forget me and just keep <laughs> on. <laughs> uh, so let's keep being with you. And uh, let me see here, I will stop share, okay. Well, I'll end the poll here. We have a hundred percent excellent. You guys are you know, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks a lot, Bob. Again, you know, always good to be with you. Yes, thank and thank you very much, everybody. We appreciate this. Uh, you know, hopefully there's there's good information here that you can use. Uh, but but certainly don't hesitate to reach out if we can answer any questions that you might have that we didn't address during our polls. And if there's any particular topics that you would really like for us to kind of uh, dig into a little more deep that would be worthwhile for a, a large group. We'd love to. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, yeah. Let us know so we can, you know, work on that. Sometimes we don't know what to talk about, so we need your input to work on your webinars. Okay, Bob. Well, have a good rest of the day. I'm the cleaning guys are moving around, so it means it's for my, my time to go home. Ciao. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being with us. Bye, bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye, bye.